Well, if it's your first time here, welcome. My name is Ryan. I'm the pastor. Thank you for joining us on this post-Christmas Sunday. You know, all through high school, I worked as a short order cook at a local restaurant outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The restaurant was open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We were closed on one day of the year and one day only. December 25th, and I loved that day, and I hated that day. I loved it because I got a real day off, like a bona fide day off. No one was going to call me in a panic from the restaurant to come in at some odd hour of the night and flip eggs because someone called off during the bar rush. But I hated this day because my manager, Paul, would also always make us do inventory up until midnight on the 24th. And not a year went by that I didn't find some kind of horrific looking vegetable rotting in the cooler or some piece of fish or chicken or beef or all three of them combined that had been neglected for months in a corner of the freezer just shriveled up and frostbitten. But after doing this inventory for a few years with Paul, I started to understand why we always had to do it on that specific day. When everything was tallied up, we knew exactly what we had and exactly what we'd wasted. That's why we were doing this. Everything got accounted for. And I would imagine that gave my manager, Paul, a lot of peace before he went home to be with his family for Christmas the next morning. He knew that he would be closing out the year knowing exactly where the restaurant stood. Now, today is the last Sunday of 2019, and as it gets close to January 1st, New Year's Day, perhaps you also find yourself doing your own kind of inventory inside of yourself. What was gained in your life this year? What was lost in your life this year? What did you learn this year that you didn't know last year? What did you find that had gone rotten within you? In some dark corner of you and you weren't even aware of it being there until you started the inventory. We ask ourselves questions like these during this time of the year. And as we gather this one last time in 2019, I want us to take a deeper look at this passage that Anna just shared with us about how the arrival of Jesus into the world was, by God's design, intended to get us to look at our lives and to take a deeper inventory of them. Not for fear or for self-loathing, but so that we can continue on the path of becoming our very best selves. The passage that we just heard Anna read picks up after Christmas has come and gone, although no one called it Christmas back then at this time in history. But Jesus has been born and a period of 40 days has passed when Jesus' parents are required by the law of Moses to come and make an offering at the temple. All Jews had to do this. And there they encounter a man named Simeon. We actually were able to, um, this is an actual photograph of Simeon we were able to dig up out of the archives with white baby Jesus. <laughs> Jesus looked absolutely nothing like that, I guarantee you. But we know very little about this man named Simeon other than what's said of him in this story. It's the only time he's talked about. He wasn't a priest. He wasn't a teacher. The passage simply says that he was a righteous and devout man. And Simeon tells the Holy Family that God has revealed to him that he will not die until he sees the Messiah. Then he grabs the baby out of Mary's arms 
And he starts talking over it in religious gibberish. Can you imagine that? Imagine, you know, whether you're here today and you have a partner and you have kids or not. Just imagine this with me for a second. Imagine that you and your partner just had a baby. It's been 40 days. And you're walking down Wilson Lane to come to church in Bethesda on Sunday morning to have your child dedicated to God. And you enter the, the narthex, the lobby out there, and some guy you've never met before is standing across the lobby and he shouts at you and he goes, Hey! You're here! God told me about you. God told me about your new baby. God told me I won't die until I see your new baby. And then he walks across the lobby over to you, grabs your baby out of your hands, and starts saying strange religious things. How would you respond if that happened to you? <laughs> I'll tell you how I'd respond. I would gently remove my baby from his arms, and then I would tackle him and pin his body to the ground and begin bludgeoning him and then I would call the police. But Mary and Joseph don't respond like this in our story. They must have sensed something <coughs> genuine in the words of Simeon. They listened to him intently. The passage says they, they marveled at what he had to say. And Simeon, holding their infant child, turns to the child's mother and says, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many, and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. What, is, what does that mean? What's Simeon trying to say in that? Why did he say it? Why is it important? This passage, of course, has a lot to do with prophecy being fulfilled from the Old Testament that people in the Jewish community had been waiting on for thousands of years. But it also has something to say to us here today. For you and me here today, there are two very important words in this passage. And write them down in your mind or on paper, or on your phone, whatever, if it will help you remember them. Two words, this child. This child. This child. The thing that's interesting is when you study scripture as a profession and you're constantly going back over these messianic prophecies and seeing where they are mirrored in the New Testament. It's interesting how more often than not these prophecies don't speak about the Messiah as a grown-up. They talk about the Messiah as a child, an infant, or a toddler. One of the most well-known passages of scripture that's often read during this time of the year, we studied this passage in its entirety just a few weeks back. Speaking of the coming of the Messiah into the world, says right smack dab in the middle of it, the wolf shall also lay down with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion together, and what? A little child shall lead them. A little child. And Simeon echoes this in his words beginning what he's saying with the words, this child. Such important words here, we can't just read over them quickly. 
What is this saying? It's trying to tell us that the kingdom of God doesn't need more grown-ups. And this is where this idea of an inner inventory comes into play. Think about everything in your life this morning that you regret. Everything you wanted to be that you didn't become. Everything you tried to fix and only caused more damage by tinkering with it. Your failures, your mistakes, your accidents, your family of origin issues. Oh, That causes feelings for us, doesn't it? Even those of us in the room who are so proud of who we are and how successful we've been and everything that we've become. Even you have quiet moments in your life where you're confronted with your secrets that no one knows about. Even you experience regret and shame. That's the way life is. Mistakes compound with age. Failure compounds with experience. That's just the way of it. And if we're not careful, we will spend the rest of our lives trying to compensate for those things, trying to ignore them or cover them up, and in the process, only compounding them further. But the life of Jesus teaches us to live a different way. What is that way? Well, let me answer that question with another scenario. The next time you are around your infant child or your toddler, or if you don't have kids, the next time you're around your niece or your nephew, Try this. Sit them down in a chair. If you, if you can get them to, that's a feat in and of itself. Sit them down in a chair and look them straight in the eyes and, and say something like this. Hey, so can you tell me how you deal with all the regrets that you have about your life? What do you do with all the feelings that you have hanging over you that you can't escape because you failed at something so many times? Or ask them this, have you ever taken an inner inventory of yourself? What did you find out? They will stare at you in utter, utter confusion. Like you were an alien being that just arrived out of a wormhole or something. They will have no idea what you're asking. It won't even register. They won't even understand your question. Why? Because they're little children. They're kids. They're young. That's what it is to be a little child, to have innocence. And this is what this means for you and me today. Here in modernity, on the other side of fulfilled prophecy, these words of Simeon are admonishing us to reclaim our innocence, our wonder, our childishness. And yes, when we do that, people will speak up against it. They will look down on you for it. Yes, it will make you take an inventory of yourself. And the deepest thoughts of your heart will be revealed. Yes, it will feel at times like a sword is piercing your own soul, too. But it's what God wants. God wants us to get back to the beautiful simplicity of children. What's interesting is, is that throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus as a baby, and then all of a sudden, he's all grown up some 30-some years later. And the baby in this passage in Luke, 
30 some years later says this in the Gospel of Matthew and it looks like he remembered this lesson it says he called Jesus Jesus called a little child to him and placed the child among them and he said truly I tell you unless you change and become like little children you will never see the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If anyone causes one of these little ones to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around their neck and to be drowned in the river. Well, I mean, tell us what you really think, Jesus. Don't, don't mince words here. Unless you change, unless I change, unless we change and go back, deconstruct, reduce, simplify. Unless we change and become like little children, we will never experience the things of the kingdom of heaven. And it takes courage to change like that. It takes wisdom and spiritual effort to change like that. Because the world around us is streaming, demands at us in a thousand different mediums, saying things like, hurry up, get more. Why aren't you there yet? Develop for God's sake. Get out ahead of it. Get it done. Don't rock the boat. Pay your dues so you can get to the spot you want to get to. Don't make a mess. Don't play. Don't have fun. Don't experiment. Don't enjoy yourself. This is not about enjoying yourself. Don't be amazed. Don't wonder. Just grow up. And do it right now, quickly. And yet what God is saying to us through passages like these is that we ought to live our lives fully engaged. But we ought not lose our innocence in the process. And the thing about innocence is we're all born with it. And any time we've lost it, we have to go back and reclaim it. It's not something that we gain by adding more and going forward. It's about looking behind us and going back. God is telling us in these passages to leave room in our grown-up lives for play, for experimentation, and for enjoyment. That's how we were created to be. And if we don't use it, we'll lose it. The kingdom of God doesn't need more grown-ups. And if there is anything that is plaguing the Christian faith at this time in history, it is this right here. It's why people take scripture and do horrible things with it. Why? Because they read scripture 
like a grown-up. You ask my kids what the point of Scripture is, and they'll say something general to you like, oh, Scripture teaches us that God loves us, or Scripture's trying to show us how to be kind. You ask a grown-up what the point of Scripture is, and they'll say something like, well, there are a number of theories about the Scriptures, and let me begin answering that question with some thoughts on epistemology. This is why someone can open their Bible and read about a God in Christ that tells us to love all, to serve all, to be kind, to be in the world in a constant state of nonviolence. It's, it's how they can take those words and twist them into something that says separate, build walls, keep people apart. It's us and them. Because they've lost their innocence. They've forgotten what it means to look out at the world like a child. Is there any childishness left in us at all? There ought to be. Because that's where God lives. And in all of your thoughts and dreams about the coming year, as you think about all of the things that you want to do and you want to accomplish, that's wonderful. That's good. But I would also challenge you to ask yourself one of the most important questions we can ask in our lives as you head into the new year. That question is, what can I subtract? What needs reduced in me? Where am I overcompensating? Where am I overdoing it? Do I rest? Do I enjoy? Do I have blank space in my life? Or is every moment just crammed full of things you want to accomplish? Though we might think of ourselves as grown-up, learned, wise beings, God looks down and he sees a bunch of toddlers. And that's not a, a put-down. <coughs> God sees us as kids. And God wants us to enjoy being his children. That's who we are created to be in the midst of a world that's always telling us to grow up. Let's pray.